Now, yep. I, I've got some bad news, Joe. What? I don't have a card for this That's next guy. That's because we threw it out. Okay, I have, I have a little job for everybody. I want everybody to put their hands over their head. Everybody put your hands over their head. We're exercising. I want everybody to take a good stretch. Then I want you to take your hands, reach down, and grab the sides of your seat. Hold on, okay? Because the next speaker is going to really impact you. Okay, this person is going to challenge you. He challenges the establishment. He's going to give you some amazing information. I am super excited to welcome up to the stage my mentor, the person who challenges me every day, the person who tells me, Joe, you're doing it wrong. Do it this way. Dr. Ken Barry. Oh, hi. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. Okay. So over this, over this weekend, you've heard the science. Lots of science, right? You've heard the personal stories. And now it's time to go home and put all that together and come up with something that works for you. Right? Because nobody's going to leave here and be like, nah, that was a load of crap. I'm just going to, whatever, it's fine. You're going to go home and you're going to be like, I want that. I want some of that. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to pull all this together and distill it into key principles that you can take home. I'm going to try to arm you with knowledge. I'm going to try to give you an armor of knowledge so that you can go home and gird your loins because with the with the enemies that we have you need to protect your loins <laughs> okay so keto I love it I've been doing it over 10 years it's awesome but the term has been bastardized it has been hijacked it has been kidnapped and held for ransom. Anytime a big corporation sees something that's becoming very popular, they see dollar signs and they're going to jump on it. That's why when you go to the grocery now, there's keto bread, there's keto Twizzlers, there's keto cookies and candy bars, right? Okay, so I, I thought, and then also for many people, keto sounds dangerous because, you know, it might give you keto crotch or keto butt crack, something. It's, I don't know, I read this article in, in this woman's magazine that it might do this thing. So it sounds very sciencey to people who are like, I don't know, I, I just eat food. I don't know, keto sounds really weird. I don't think I could do that. So I thought, well, let's, let's call it what it actually is. Let's call it a proper human diet. And so I'm gonna give you the principles as I see it of a proper human diet so that you can go home armed with these principles. And so when a big uh, multinational corporation comes at you with television commercials or internet commercials or magazine ads, oh, keto, whatever, you can be like, no, no, mm -mm, right? When your doctor comes at you and says, you know, the science shows that a plant-based diet, you can be like, no, mm-mm. No, okay? So let's, let's go through these quickly, and I'm, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bunch of questions at the end because I love that I think that helps more than anything is to answer your questions. So obviously we know, we've heard all weekend about all the things that eating an improper diet will give you. Regardless of your age, your gender, your nationality, if you eat things that you should not eat, it's going to lead to inflammation and disease. If you don't eat things you should be eating, it's going to lead to vitamin and mineral deficiencies, amino acid, fatty acid deficiencies, all of which are essential to your optimal health. That's why we need to talk about this. Uh, there are powers and principalities that are against this. But what I want you to understand is that you are a very powerful group. 
okay? How many, how many people have heard of Weight Watchers? You heard of Weight Watchers? <clears throat> They've been around since 1969. So if, if Weight Watchers actually worked as good as keto works, they would have been bankrupt in 1975. But they're still going strong. Well, they actually, they were going strong until keto became very popular. Remember a few years back they rebranded? That's because they were hemorrhaging profits. And I predict another rebranding in another year or two because they're still hemorrhaging profits. Because once somebody discovers a proper human diet, they don't need Weight Watchers anymore. They, they, they literally offer you no value. And when a corporation stops being able to offer you value, they go bankrupt. And so unless Weight Watchers decides to come up with uh, keto Weight Watchers, they, they're going to go bankrupt in a few years. So when I talk about these multi-billion dollar corporations, I don't want you to feel powerless. I want you to understand that people like you and millions of other people just like you are in the process of bankrupting one of the biggest, oldest weight loss corporations that's ever existed on the planet. You understand? You see my point? Don't think, oh, I'm just one little guy. No, no, no. When you take, you know, I'm just one little David. Well, guess what? When you've got millions of Davids running around, the Goliaths are in trouble. And they know this, and they talk about this in the boardrooms every day. So know your power and know your worth. A PhD is not factory made, okay? It grazes, it grows, it swims, it crawls, it slithers, it's, it flies. Uh, yes, bugs are PhD, worms are PhD, but I prefer beef. <laughs> but if it came to it, I would sure enough have a tablespoon of worms or, or crickets or bugs if I had to before I would eat the wheat, 100%, okay? So you cannot scale up the production and distribution of real food. And I've talked about this with multiple people in the keto food sphere. I believe it's impossible for you to take ribeye or broccoli and scale that up and mass produce it so that it's shelf stable, that you can ship it all over the world and it can sit there for a year and somebody can buy it. That's, that's impossible. So now you understand why the big corporations are trying to hijack keto right? Because they can never make real food, real human food, and mass produce it and mass market it. That, it just doesn't work that way. And so in the process of you guys all adopting a proper human diet, you're also going to be encouraging your local farmer and your local rancher. Now, do you think the big corporations want you to do that? No, they don't want that at all. Again, the, the, the power is yours. You've just got to take it. A PhD is, by definition, low-carbohydrate, okay? Humans are, by design, low-carbohydrate mammals. Now, I, I got my bachelor's degree in animal biology and comparative vertebrate anatomy. So I've always kind of been in the animal biology sphere. Then I went to med school and focused on just one mammal. That's us, Okay? So very early in this, when I, when I started doing keto, I started looking not only in, at the human literature, but also at the animal literature as well. And some animals need to eat a very high-carbohydrate diet. Others need to eat a very low-carbohydrate diet. We are one of those, okay? The proper human diet spectrum, there's not one diet for every human, but there is a spectrum. Some people who are young and physically active, and slender, they can eat up to 100 total grams of carbs a day. Real carbs, real food, still real food that we're talking about here, okay? Some of us have to be 50 total grams, some 20 total grams to get the results, the optimization we're looking for. Some people like me have to be as close to zero carb as they can possibly get in order to have the body, the health markers, the, the mental and physical health that they're after. You've got to decide where, where you fall on that spectrum. That can change based on your age, your gender, your hormone status, uh, your, your, how long you've been metabolically ill. All those things matter, okay? And so start somewhere on the proper 
human diet spectrum after you've heard all these principles. It might be low carb, it might be keto, it might be ketovore, it might be carnivore. You might be one of the very few people that needs a lion diet, which I'll answer questions about if, if, we, if you have one about it later. A proper human diet is by definition uninflammatory. Okay? If you eat something and it causes <clears throat> gut inflammation, then by definition, that's not part of your proper human diet. If you eat something and it causes joint inflammation or skin inflammation or it causes your mental, mental health symptoms to get worse, by definition, that is not part of your proper human diet spectrum. Does that make sense? So some of us can eat all the broccoli and all the spinach because those things don't really seem to bother us. Other people, they can look at the spinach and they've got gut symptoms for three days. That's why this is a spectrum. That's why all these principles apply to you. You may be able to eat that, and he can't eat that. She can't touch that. She can't even think about it, or she'll have a flare-up. That It's uninflammatory by design. Okay? Human, human nature and mother nature work together. Mother nature is not going to give you a food that's part of your proper diet that causes inflammation. So we've talked about the sugar, the, the seed oils, the grains, the additives and colors we haven't talked about, but some people are much more sensitive to those than other people, right? But if you're eating real, whole, one ingredient, ancestrally appropriate, proper human diet food, are there going to be any additives or colors? Okay, so that kind of eliminates that. Uh, natural flavors, you know, I don't know if you've looked into this, but they can put hundreds of ingredients in the processed foods and call them natural flavors. So you could literally come up with a snack bar and put a little bit of rat shit in it <laughs> and call it natural flavors, 100%. Okay? Now, also big food corporations, I just learned this yesterday. I, I sort of knew of it, but I didn't know the details. They can have up to 2% of a, pro of a product by weight, 1.99% got to be less than 2%, can be something that they say is a production enhancer. So it's not part of the product. It just helps in the production that can literally be thousands of chemicals. And if it's less than 2% of the, the total weight of the product, they don't have to put it on the ingredient list. That's federal law in the United States. Think about that. Do you trust Kraft and Kellogg's? I don't. I don't know. Maybe you do. For some people, <clears throat> phytochemicals, phytonutrients are very inflammatory. For other people, they don't seem to be inflammatory at all. Don't you find it funny that your doctor wants to talk about phytonutrients all the damn time, even though there's not a single essential phytonutrient known to man? You find that odd? So then we come to some people have to be carnivores or lions. They have to be to get the inflammation as low as possible. A PhD is ancestral. Now, let's be very specific about this because this is somewhere where they'll trip you up. When I say it's ancestrally appropriate, I mean that it has been around and available for humans to eat for more than 15,000 years. Okay. Because what, if, if you don't watch them, they'll say, oh, well, we found this guy frozen in the ice in northern Italy, and he had grains in his stomach. So there you go. <clears throat> Something happened to Earth 12 to 13,000 years ago, and nobody's sure what it was, but it was a huge catastrophe, and it killed many of the megafauna that we had eaten for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. And so then we were left, we used to have armadillos the size of Volkswagens, and then all we had was rabbits and venison, very lean, very low fat. And so we had to start farming. We had to. We didn't, it wasn't a modern invention. It wasn't a, a, a miracle of human invention. It was either that or starve to death. And we'll talk more about starvation in a second. So for 99 0.99% of our time on this planet, we've been eating all the meat, the fatty meat, the red meat. We've been cooking our meat over a fire, which is going to involve some charring, 
for at least a million years. All these things are ancestrally appropriate. Okay, we've only been farming grains for about 12,000 years, depending on what part of the world you're talking about. Modern fruit, have you guys seen my Twitter posts about modern fruit versus ancient fruit? What it looked like then versus what it looks like now. Now you can get a seedless grape that's as big as a plum. Uh, is anybody, if you grew up in the South, you know what a possum grape is. Anybody know what that is? It's these little grapes that are about the size of your pinky tip that are, as, that are sour beyond words. That's what a real grape is. And so a lot of people are in love with the concept of natural. Oh, fruit is natural. Fruit is natural. It grows on a plant. But the problem is, is we have crossbred fruit for the last few hundred years to the point where they're just basically big sacks of sugar. Now, if you're going to eat something, I'd much rather you eat some fruit than eat some Oreos. But just because something is less bad doesn't make it good. So always keep that in mind. A lot of people say, oh, well, modern wheat is the problem. If you were to eat ancient wheat, einkorn wheat, emmer wheat, well, no, that's baloney because we have done CAT scans on hundreds of Egyptian mummies from all the socioeconomic stratus. They all had severe dental disease. All the men had man boobs, and they all had severe heart coronary artery disease. And they, guess what? They didn't have modern GMO wheat. They were eating ancient grains, fruits, almost no red meat at all, but they had severe coronary artery disease. How is that possible? They weren't eating our modern wheat. They weren't, they weren't eating any red meat at all. They had some fish and some fowl, but no red meat. <clears throat> so you've got to understand, people will try to trip you up to sell their product. But if you know these principles, they won't trip you up. A proper human diet is nutrient-dense. We all enjoy eating real human food. There's pleasure in that, no doubt. But the reason you eat is for nutrition. If anybody out there listening to this, if the food that you eat each day is, is your biggest pleasure of the day, there's a problem in your life. And I'm not going to call on anybody, but if, if you're sitting there going, well, yeah, food is my biggest pleasure of the day, that's a problem. That's not normal. You need to work on your life, okay? Food is pleasurable, no doubt, but you eat food for amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. Notice I didn't say phytonutrients. Okay. You want the nutrients to be bioavailable. Like uh, Dr. Ballerstadt was saying earlier today, just because there's vitamins or minerals in a grain, if it's locked up in the phytates and the lectins and the oxalates and you can't have access to it, does that help you? It doesn't help you. They've got to be bioavailable. You need preformed vitamins. If you want to trip a lot of your friends up, ask them, what's the most vitamin A rich food that you can eat? What are they going to say? Carrots or kale every damn time. How much vitamin A is in carrots and kale? Not a single bit of real vitamin A in carrots or kale. It's beta carotene, which is a precursor. Some of us can convert that to vitamin A. Most of us don't convert very much of that to vitamin A at all. Okay? Then back to the phytonutrients. And what about fiber? Fiber has never been proven essential for humans. Even though all your doctor wants to talk about is phytonutrients and fiber. Phytonutrients and fiber, neither are essential. If I, if I locked you in my barn and fed you bacon and eggs and steak for the rest of your life, never another shred of fiber, no, no phytonutrients, would you die? Or would you literally optimize your physical and mental health and break out of my barn and kick my ass. <laughs> yeah, that's what would happen. That's right. But they love to talk about phytonutrients and fiber. Wonder why? Because both of those can be added to products, can't they? Yeah, interesting. A proper human diet by design is satiating. It has healthy fat, healthy protein, which equals happy belly long time. 
Happy belly long time means you're not going to need to snack. You're not going to be hungry every two hours. You're going to be full, and you're going to have all the nutrition you need, and you're going to go outside and play. Or you're going to do, go do something productive. There are hormones in your body that you don't necessarily have to know about, but the people up on this stage better know about them. Leptin, leptin ghrelin, neuropeptide Y, peptide YY, GLP-1, and there's many others. But these are in charge of when you get hungry. These are in charge of when you get full. Unless you've mucked up your system with nutrient void, inflammatory, non-satiating food. At which point, you confuse your system and the hormones don't work right. That's how it's possible for a human being to reach weights of 500, 600, 700, 800 pounds. You can't do that eating a proper human diet. I defy somebody, I'll bet you a thousand bucks that you can't eat a proper human diet as I've defined it in these principles and gain to seven, 800 pounds. It is literally impossible. Okay? But you can do that very easily with the foods that Post and General Mills and Kellogg's tell you are healthy. A proper human diet optimizes your health. Grains don't do that. Seed oils don't do that. Sugar, tubers, legumes, none of these things optimize your health. What about eating grass? Doc, Dr. Ballerstadt talked about that. We can't do that. Now, if you want to lose weight, go on the grass-only diet because you will lose a ton of weight, but you'll be very unhealthy in the process. Did you know that there's many products on the grocery store shelf that have sawdust in them? Although it doesn't say sawdust on the product ingredient list. Yeah, where do they get the cellulose? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, there, are, there are stories back in the Depression where people actually would pull the shoe leather off their shoes, boil it, and eat it because they were literally starving to death. That does not mean it optimizes your health. A proper human diet improves your health markers. Your A1C, your C-peptides, your fasting insulin, your triglycerides, your HDL cholesterol, all these things get better on a proper human diet. I have people sometimes re reach out to me and they're like, I'm eating keto and my A1C actually went up. And I'm like, mm -mm, no, physiology doesn't work that way. You think you're eating keto, but what you're eating, you're drinking slim fast keto and eating all the keto snacks and cookies and cakes and pies and baked goods, you, you're trying to do better, but it doesn't work that way. You can't raise your A1C if you're eating a proper human diet. It doesn't work that way, okay? Inflammatory markers, they're going to come closer to normal. Maybe not all the way, but they're going to improve on a proper human diet. The particle size, they're going to get better. The, what about your total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol? Why is that all your doctor wants to talk about? Because they know they can't, they can't fix your triglycerides. There's no pill for that. Big Pharma has tried for decades to come up with a pill that raises HDL. There's a whole story behind that. And every single time they did the research, people start, they die if they're taking the HDL raising medicine. They die more often. They can't, they can't get one FDA approved. But they can lower your LDL. Yes, they can. And they can lower your total cholesterol. So guess what they want to talk about? Remember the hammer and the nail. A proper human diet improves chronic disease. In many cases, it reverses it completely. How many of you guys have reversed type 2 diabetes or know someone who has reversed their type 2 diabetes back to a normal A1C? What's the definition of type 2 diabetes? Because you'll get a lot of kickback, like, oh, no, it's just in remission. And I tell the story about my dog, Blue, right, who was getting poisoned with antifreeze. Very sick, he's very sick. Took him to the vet, and doc, he said, he's being poisoned. So when we stopped letting Blue get poisoned, he got better. So how should we say that? Should we say that we, we cured his poisoning, or should we say that his antifreeze poisoning is just in remission. <laughs> Think about that. Type 2 diabetes is carbohydrate toxicity syndrome. That's what it is. So when you remove what's making you toxic, you go back to normal. Same goes for hypertension. Same goes for 
uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. That, some doctors are trying to rename it, and I think that's a great thing. Uh, calling it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you're just calling it what it ain't. Why would you do that? Well, let's call it what it is, metabolic associated fatty liver disease, because that's what it is. PCOS, mental health disorders, more and more I'm getting reports, anecdotal reports, but reports nonetheless of people who say, I had a severe eating disorder, bulimia, anorexia, binge eating, whatever. It's so much better now. Does keto do that? A proper human diet includes fasting. No, it can be accidental fasting or it can be intentional fasting, okay? Uh, some, some influencers will say, you don't need to fast if you're eating carnivore. And that may be true for you. But what most carnivores and most people uh, on ketovore or keto find is they, they effortlessly fast. You just forget to eat because you're not hungry because you ate such nutrient-dense, satiating food at the last meal. You're not hungry for many hours. Some people do an intermittent fast every day like I do. Some people fast every once a week they'll do a 48-hour. Or once a month they'll do a three-day fast. Right? You get to choose. You get to play around with all this stuff because fasting will never hurt you. You know how long human beings have been fasting? There's no un, untold millions of years our ancestors have been fasting. Back then, you didn't call it fasting. You called it starving because you couldn't find any food. Right? And so instead of our body, body just slowly shutting down and dying if you don't eat for two hours our body actually gets better, gets stronger, starts healing, starts rejuvenating when you fast because it happens so frequently and for so many eons that our body actually uses it as, a, as somewhat of a superpower. A proper human diet is a species-specific diet that works with your body's physiology and biochemistry to provide the best possible physical and mental health. It doesn't scale up. As I said earlier, you can't scale up real food to a mass distribution, multinational corporation, multi-billion dollar. It doesn't work that way. So by definition, it's going to spur and encourage a local economy. You're going to have, you're going to have local uh, egg, egg layers who, who've got chickens in the backyard. You're going to have local ranchers with sheep and beef and goats. You're going to have local gardeners growing all kinds of produce. That's a good thing. In these days and times, don't you want your food to be local? At some point in the very near future, we may change that and say you need your food to be local unless you're ready to do the old school fasting, which is starving. It's currently very un unpopular. It triggers a lot of people. It's denigrated. It's marginalized. But that's because there's money to be made with the alternative. Okay, if you make and mass market some highly processed thing made of grains and sugars and vegetable seed oils, you can make anywhere from 15 to 20 percent market profit. If you raise or grow real food and sell that, you're going to make three to five percent profit. So what do you think Kraft Heinz wants to focus on? A proper human diet's the way, folks. I am a medical doctor, a family doctor. But as I said earlier, I had this background in animal science and in, in vertebrate comparative anatomy. And so when I started doing this, I first thought it was just a temporary weight loss hack. That's why I started. I was fat. Then I started looking into the research. I found there's quite a bit of human research. But when you start looking at the archaeology, uh, where's Cucuzella? How much nutrition training did you get in med school? None? I got a little. You got none? 100%. Yeah, that's right. How much, how much anthropological training did you get in med school? None. How much paleoanthropological? None. But think about this. Doesn't it seem important that we should know what human beings were eating? 20, 50, 100,000 years ago? Doesn't that seem like that should, that should matter, right? Doctors barely get any training in nutrition at all. But then when it comes to, hey, what did humans eat 100,000 years ago? When did we start cooking with fire? Uh, 
<laughs> literally crickets chirping, none, zero, none. And, it, and for the average doctor, it doesn't even occur to them that they should know any of that. What's that matter? I'm just going to give you a statin anyway. A proper human diet is timeless. It's not patentable. You can't make 20% on it. Therefore, no corporation is interested in it, which is a good thing in my opinion. Okay, but they don't think it's a good thing, and so they're going to try to hire public relations firms to keep putting out articles about keto crotch. Oh, keto might kill your kidneys. Oh, keto might do this. Oh, keto might do that. And then when you trace it back, you find out it was a pasta company who paid a public relations firm to, to simultaneously publish the articles about keto crotch in like 40 different publications. And when you, when you look up, just Google keto crotch and start looking at the articles, it's literally cut and paste. It's the same article, just a different outlet. They're scared of you guys. Weight Watchers is terrified of you guys but there's not a thing that they can do about it because they can't make 20% profit on it. So the shareholders have no interest in it. They cannot scale it up and make 20%. They cannot have it to be shelf-stable for two, three, four years. Therefore, the producers are not interested in it. Okay? But you should be very, very interested in it because it is the way for you back to the health that you deserve. The physical health and the mental health, this is the way. Okay, so you need to be very protective of whatever moniker you want to put on the way you eat. Whether it's keto, ketovore, carnivore, proper human diet, whatever you want to call it, you need to be very protective. And you need to be quickly ready to call somebody out on social media or in person and say, hey, that's not keto. I don't know who told you it was, but it ain't. Okay, that's not part of a proper human diet. I don't care what the PR firm said. Now, I am gonna do, I'm going to give away something, and then I think two crazy ketos want to give away something. And then I'm going to answer as many of your questions as I can answer and try to really send you home with a complete and thorough understanding of the principles of a proper human diet. Now, Joe... See if you can, I want to know who thinks they've, they have had or do currently have the highest A1C in the room. What's the highest, who's, who's, who wants to go first? What's your highest A1C? In the past, any time in the past, what was the highest A1C? 13. Can anybody beat 13? That ain't you. <laughs> who can beat 13? What you got? 13.5. Do I have do I hear 13.6? <laughs> Can anybody beat 13.5? Anybody? Going once? Going twice? Tell her what she's won, Joe. How much will the CIMP scheme benefit her? Oh, tremendously. Yeah, because with an A1C that high for however many years you had it, you probably did some damage, right? And it would benefit you greatly to know what your current level of damage is so that you can then make decisions in the future. On my birthday, on my anniversary, is it worth having a piece of that cake? Or should I just be like, 100% mm -mm, PhD for me till the day I die? Because I want to live a long damn time. Very valuable to know how the lining of your arteries currently looks. Hundred percent. Get these microphones on. Dr. Barry's gonna answer a bunch of questions. Yes, definitely. Maybe now, start up. yeah. If you guys have questions, go to either side, either wall, and I'm gonna answer every single question I can. 
Does everybody agree with me? Joe's fairly good looking, but Rachel is hot. <laughs> right? Sorry, Joe. We're, we're the second best looking couple in Jewish because you got you and Nisha. Okay, I want to I give away a copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me. The, the publisher, uh, once again, didn't ship books. So this is a signed copy. I'm going to give it to anybody. If they can tell me the four corporations who control more than 80% of the meat production oh, I know, I know, I know. in the United States. You can't answer, Joe. Does anybody, what are the, who are the four corporations that control over 80% of all the meat sold in the United States of America? Who knows? Yes, sir? Tyson? Cargill? You meant JBS, right? There's one more. Do you know? Who knows? That's it. JBS, Cargill, National Beef, and Tyson. They control 80% of the meat sold in the United States of America. Are you okay with that? 80%? So if these guys just decided suddenly or were coerced by a federal government or by a billionaire to convert you over to plant-based, then 80% of your meat would disappear overnight? Are you okay with that? Then I would encourage you strongly to find a local rancher and to find a local uh, poultry person and to find a local gardener and start sourcing your food locally. Give this man his book. Good job. So if you're interested in asking Dr. Bear a question, go ahead and line up either by me or Joe. I want to say right now, I'm, I'm, you're never going to be more awkward than I am in a room. So super safe, super approachable. We want you to get your questions answered. This, this is your opportunity to ask him questions. Nobody has Doesn't a question. Doesn't come very often. Oh, here's a question. Okay, come on, guys. Here we go. If you don't have a question, that's fine. But if you have a question and you don't ask it, we're not friends. <laughs> so this is a follow-up to what I asked you earlier. If GERD is causing chronic cough and omeprazole is prescribed and that gets rid of it, so we know that's what it was. Yep. I don't want to stay on omeprazole. What do I do to combat that yep. GERD from that point on? Yep. So 99% of GERD reflux can be completely eliminated. I used to have the most severe reflux pain imaginable back when I was 297 pounds. I took two Nexium every single day, which is the strongest proton pump inhibitor on the market, at least at that time. When the drug rep came with samples, the patients didn't get those. I got those, okay? I haven't taken anything for reflux in four years. So now there are some people with a very few, very, very rare disorders that might still have reflux after adopting a proper human diet and continuing it for six months, but it's going to be super, super rare. So I would say, uh, this is your wife. Yeah, so keep cutting the carbs, keep getting rid of anything that's inflammatory, keep eating proper human food, and just repeat. And then if this is a reflux-induced cough, which is possible, it'll be better in a week or two of the, of the omeprazole. Then you'll know what it is, but then also you'll know that the omeprazole, is that going to fix it? Is that, is, does that fix the root cause? No, it's just going to help the symptoms temporarily enough to tell you that's what's causing it. Then you're going to use a proper human diet to reverse it, and then you won't take the omeprazole anymore. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, so uh, I'm an RN. I've spent most of my career in uh, ICU critical care, and I got tired of putting bodies in body bags. Uh, reached the point where instead of meeting patients on their last day of their life after you know decades of abuse, I wanted to make a difference, so I switched over to primary care about six months ago. Uh, just six months in the system, I am so discouraged by what medicine looks like. Um, yep. We are 
telling patients to keep their A1Cs between 7 and 8%. Every day patients are told that. Yep. The, the goal is if you can get to 7, that's it. Perfection. You've done it. You've won. Yeah. As long as it's below 8, we're really happy. As long as they keep, t keep taking those drugs, keep taking the statins, the insulin, all that stuff, we're really happy. And I'm so discouraged by a broken system because I want to make a difference and I can't where I'm at. Um, so my question for you, it, what's your advice for somebody who actually wants to make a difference for their patients' lives? Yeah. So it depends on how much you want to disrupt your current life. Uh, there, are, there are several uh, courses on becoming a, a proper human diet aware health coach. If you've got some money saved up, you could just tell them to take that job and shove it. I ain't working. You know, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, but now that may not be an option for you, in which case there are many health care providers, nurses, physical therapists, mid-level providers, nurse practitioners, physicians' assistants, who are stuck in a system. And so they have to use what I call ninja tactics. Okay? Uh, I just was talking to a post-op recovery nurse the other day. And she has to go through the full checklist, right, to be, to be JCO compliant and all that. So she tells them all the things and checks all the boxes. And then she's got a little uh, pamphlet that she made at home. And she says, now, I had to tell you all that stuff. That's my job. But when you get home, I want you to look up these YouTube channels and, and look at these books because they're actually going to help you. Okay? I was talking to a nurse practitioner a few weeks ago who works for a big medical system. Not going to name it, Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> but she has to check all her boxes. She has to recommend a plant-based diet. She has to do all the things. And then when she's done... She gives them a copy of my ketogenic guidebook, proper human diet guidebooks, 15 pages of what to eat, what not to eat. And she said, when you get home, here, here's this, and there's a YouTube, I wrote a, a YouTube channel. That's called Ninja Level, okay? So depending on what your economic situation is, pick one of those. Because as a healthcare provider, you went into this to help people, save people's lives, make people healthier. That's why you're doing it. But... Very often, healthcare providers get stuck in a system. They can't do a damn bit of good unless they step outside the box and use these ninja tactics. What's a good counter for um, an Asian background saying, well, they eat all this rice and no issues there with obesity? Yeah, so is, is obesity, is that the only marker of metabolic health? <laughs> That's right. And so it's very common for people of, of Asian origin or um, the Indian subcontinent to be very slender, living on a high-carb, highly processed diet. They can be very slender, or they'll be slender and they'll have just a little belly pooch. What is that? What's that belly pooch? Visceral adiposity. That's right. And then if, if you never check their A1C or their C-peptide, you can say, look at, these, look at this healthy guy. He's so healthy. But... If you start digging into the literature, you find that the rates of diabetes and prediabetes and metabolic syndrome are sky high in those countries. There are certain uh, genetic propensities to fatten easily, as, as Gary Taub says. Some uh, genetic backgrounds don't fatten easily. You almost can't make them fat, no matter what you feed them, but you can make them very metabolically sick. I'm one of those white boys with, with Norwegian, Scottish, Irish, Neanderthal, right? I'll get fat as a cow. I mean, I can get big as a house. But some, some people can't do that. And so it's called the personal fat threshold. You heard of that? And for some, for some of us, it's very protective against metabolic disease because we'll just get fat, but we'll still have pretty good markers. But these folks have terrible metabolic markers, but if they don't get checked... And nobody knows, do they? You just say, oh, they're skinny, therefore they must be healthy. Big myth, big myth. Good question. I have a question by proxy. Uh, will you ask Dr. Barry if he knows if Hashimoto's people should cut out eggs? I've been told and advised by different doctors that eggs aggravate the condition. Yeah. So now, how long have human beings been eating eggs? This is how you apply the proper human diet principles. How long have we been eating eggs? Millions, millions. Who knows? Who knows, right? So does it make any common sense 
that eggs would be causing an autoimmune reaction kind of doesn't make sense, right? And so if anybody thinks that they're sensitive to eggs, I always tell them, just try just the yolks. Throw away the white. Try just the yolk. Or try quail eggs or duck eggs, right? I guarantee you there's an egg you can eat, and it's not going to cause any inflammation at all. So no, I don't think eggs have any role in Hashimoto's whatsoever. Uh, Nisha, my wife, has Hashimoto's, currently in remission. She eats about six eggs a day. So I don't, yeah, no. It makes no sense, and I don't know of any literature that supports that, and also it just doesn't make sense. Did I mention that? Can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Sure. How many eggs can you eat in a day without getting sick? Uh, as many as you want. You can eat as many eggs as you can hold before your leptin, your ghrelin, your neuropeptide, right, your peptides, all go to the, the, the condition of satiety. So when you're full and you're like, God, if I eat another bite of egg, I'm going to puke. <laughs> That's when you can stop eating eggs and you're still safe. Now, if you go to the county fair and enter the egg eating contest and you eat 492 eggs, you may get sick. You may throw up. You may get egg poisoning. I don't know. But if you eat, if you let your appetite be your guide, you're never going to eat too much of a food that is obviously a proper human diet food. Ken, I've read your book. Oh, no. And I have lots of questions. Okay. I can only ask one. Yes. And thankfully, it's been so much time since I read your book, I can't even remember that. Um, no. Uh, thank you for coaching Chris and Miriam with Keto Chow. Thank you for coaching Joe and Rachel. Um, this has been a marvelous conference, my first. Um, if there's anything I, I'd, I'd like to have you follow up that book with, would be more of your instructions. You had instructions to all these um, medical professionals, you know, depending on how many years they've been in the, as doctors. Um, you could probably do the same thing now from your own 10 years experience for people who are like me. I, I, I've, uh, when I was diagnosed 10 years ago, I'd probably had insulin resistance at least 30 or 40 years before that. And I have the skin tags and things to prove it. Um, when you get ready, we'd like to hear from you again for your patience. What we can be doing and watching for as we em become empowered, our time is now. 100%. Our, I absolutely agree, our time is now because of a multitude of factors. One, 88% of the U.S. population has at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. Like that one fact alone ought to be the end of the discussion. That the system we've been doing since the 1970s is broken, it is ineffective, it is not working, it's actually making people sicker. That should be very clear and obvious. And that's why I encourage, every time I talk to one of you guys, I tell you, when you tell me your story, you've helped me so much, this is what has happened to me. What's the next thing I say to you? There are people out there who are just like you. There are people out there who have exactly the symptoms you had and exactly the chronic diseases you had that don't know about a proper human diet. They don't know. They, they, at this point, you're like, how could they not know? But yeah, trust me, I've been doing this for many years. There's, there are whole sections of our society who have no idea about this way of eating. They are sick. They are miserable. They're in pain. They're, they're in anguish. And they're waiting for somebody to come along and say the words. And they're like, wait a minute. Wait. That's my story. That's, that's exactly what I have. And this guy looks great. And he said that if you eat this way and avoid these things, that's what he did, and he got better. 
I think I will try that also. How powerful is that? Now are you starting to understand why Weight Watchers is afraid of you guys? Yep. Why Kellogg's, they're trying to marginalize you and trying to say, oh, that keto people, they're a bunch of, that's a, that's a cult. I heard it so much, I actually made a shirt, Keto Cult. <laughs> yes, own it, right? But the reason they're doing that is because they know this is the way. If you don't think Pfizer and Merck and the other multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies, they've done so many research studies that you don't know about because they didn't publish them. They have no, they have no mandate to publish studies. If they don't like the results, guess what they do with that study? They bury it. They shit can it. That's right. I love your language. Do you not think that they've done enough research on HDL and LDL? Do you not think they know that having a normal triglyceride and a normal HDL, that, that's, what, that's the goal? Do you think they don't know that lowering your LDL doesn't do a damn thing for you? Yeah, they know. And it's going to take some hungry, young assistant district attorney somewhere and then one of you guys talking to him or her and saying, you know what, there should be a class action lawsuit because I would love to have discovery. You know what that is? That's a legal term. When you file a suit, you get to discover. You get access to every email, every study that wasn't published, every manual, every training manual that tells the drug reps what to say and what not to say. You get access to all that. Wouldn't you guys like to see every bit of that? Yep. Over here. I, I had a question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, we keep uh, deprescribing medication as people's metabol metabolic health gets better. Um, on the other side, on the mental health side, how receptive are providers to be, de de be uh, when a person is strict on a diet and their mood improves? How receptive are health or mental health providers to deprescribing? Mental health providers are very, very unreceptive to deprescribing. And let me, let me give you the backstory. The mental health providers, they believe in their heart of hearts. Okay? There's no conspiracy. They believe in their heart of hearts that the, the three, four, five, six, seven, twelve medicines that they're prescribing someone with a mental health condition, they believe that's the only thing that's keeping that person from jumping off the bridge. They truly believe that they, they, that, that is the safety net that is saving that person's life. That's right. That's right. And as more and more of you guys say, you know, my depression is so much better. And you go to your mental health provider, whether that's your primary care, whether that's an actual mental health provider, and you say, you know, I've been eating keto and my depression is so much better. Can we wean down this Prozac or this Zoloft, right? Right? Now, here, let's, here's a key concept. This is your power. I'm trying to give you your power. So listen to me. When she went to her health care provider and said, what were you taking? Prozac. Prozac. Okay. How much? 60 milligrams. Shit. Right? Okay. <laughs> so that's the maximum dose. That's right. So now she went to her doctor and said, I feel better. Did you say, let's wean this down? or let's Okay. So she went from 60 to 40 to 20, then stopped or went to 10, then to 10, and then stopped. Now, you think, okay, that's great for her. Yay. Great. Awesome. But wait a minute. Let's, let's focus on the doctor. What did the doctor think about that? She was scared. She was scared. Yeah. Right. Because it's probably the first time she's ever had somebody say that to her. Okay. So one person, that happened to one person. Is that doctor going to change her practice based on that? Nope. Nope. What about when the 10th person mm -hmm. talks to her and says, I want to wean down off the Zoloft. I don't think I need it anymore. What happens when the 50th person goes to her and says, can we stop this Paxil? I don't think I need it anymore. At some point, that doctor is going to say, what the hell are you, what, what are all y'all doing? Oh, keto, she asked. Okay, now when she's heard that enough times, what's she going to go home and do that night? She's going to Google that shit. <laughs> and when she does, she's going to hear the bell ring. And what can you not unhear when you hear it? Yeah. That's right. That's it. Now she knows. Not only have I seen multiple patients wean down and stop their SSRIs, 
Now, I've, actually, I've looked it up, and there's actually there's science, and there's ongoing studies. Now, here's your power. You ready? Here's how that's powerful. She helped her health, and that's awesome. But when, she, when enough of her goes to that primary care provider or that mental health provider, and they, she hears the same thing, then she looks it up, then she does the research, and then she knows, how many patients does that health care provider have? 500? 1,000? Kukuzela, how many, how many patients do you have in your practice? I bet he's got a bunch because I had a bunch. When you're the lone wolf in the, you got a bunch. You just change the way that doctor practices medicine. Think about that. You literally change, you're, you're, just a, you're just, what do you do for a living? Now, but what did you used to, back in your former life? Okay, so you were you were a, a nurse or a uh, just in the office manager. Okay, so you're you you were an office worker. Yes. This office worker just changed the way a doctor practices medicine. And that impacted every single patient that that doctor will see for the rest of their career. Now are you starting to see the power? That's why you can't be silent. You you must be respectfully diplomatically vocal about this. You've got to tell your doctor, hey, I'm on keto, and let me just tell you, my blood pressure is 112 over 65. Can we lower the blood pressure medicine, please? When they've heard that enough times, what are they going to start to recommend to their patients with hypertension? You see my point? That's the power you guys possess. Autumn! Hello, Hello Autumn. Hey, Autumn's awesome, right? <laughs> I love you. Okay, so I have a question. So thankfully, I was luckily enough, uh, lucky enough to find keto early in life, right? And I've even been able to influence my mother and, and older, you know, aunts and cousins and family members. But, you know, then there's the grandmothers. There's the people that have been doing the same thing for decades and decades, right? Yep. And so what would be your advice for someone like myself to influence an older person, say 70 plus, who has grown up hearing that everything's better with blue bonnet on it right. and that, you know, that they think they need their orange juice for vitamin C. I've got to have my potassium and my banana and that just blindly believes that everything their doctor yeah. says is right, so I have to do it. But they, they're not going to turn on YouTube. They're not going to scroll your Instagram. Right. What can we say like offline to, to kind of plant those seeds for them? Yeah, I love it. Very, very powerful question and, and a great opportunity to have an impact on someone's health that you love. Your grandmother, your grandfather, uncle, aunt. So what I would do is first and foremost, fix your own stuff, right? Because they see you. They see you all the time. They see you in pictures. They see you in, in person. When they look at you, and I'm not just talking about your weight or your waist circumference. I'm talking about your overall health. When they see you happy and glowing and like, damn, you look great, Autumn, right? What, do you, what did you do? Now, if you get that question, you're home free. When you hear that question, they're ready, they're receptive, they want to know, and you can start to help them. Another great strategy is to find a friend of theirs that they have coffee with or find a, uh, your uncle or your aunt to talk to the grand. Because a lot of times there's this thing called powdered butt syndrome. Yeah. You guys heard of this? If somebody ever changed your dirty little diaper and watched you pick your nose and wipe it under the couch, that's powder butt syndrome. You could be a brain surgeon and a rocket scientist. They ain't going to listen to you. Right? So that you have to go around. You have to pull a ninja trick. You have to talk to the uncle or talk to the coffee buddy who knows about keto or teach them about keto because they'll be much more receptive than your grandmother. And then they can go and start talking to your grandmother about this. She'll listen to them. And then what's going to happen when she starts to improve her health, she's going to come to you and say, Autumn, you got to try this keto. It is so awesome. <laughs> There's multiple ways around that. You can't just say, well, she won't listen to me. I give up. There's always a way. You just got to keep looking and keep working. Hello. Non-scale victory, I am here today alone. I have CPTSD, major depression, panic anxiety disorder, and adult ADD. And I'm here alone. 
My mental health therapist has helped me go from what is doubly the normal high for my particular antidepressive because it was so bad. She's now taken me down to where I was once taking four 500 milligram tablets. I take 75 a day. Wow. My concern is I have always been naturally high triglyceride. From the, the very first blood panel I ever had, it was high. I now incorporate MCT because of my mental issues. It's still high. Yep. What can I do other than getting rid of the MCT to help lower it? So get it, first of all, the, okay. First of all, let's talk about her mental health provider. What kind of lesson, what, what was the takeaway? If you were that, if you were her mental health provider, what would you think about that? How many years have you been seeing her? <coughs> Five years and she's keto now. You remember that thing earlier I talked about that the, all the power's yours? You just have to, you have to take the handles and you have to start doing this? She converted her mental health provider. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so first of all, the MCT oil is not what's giving you high triglycerides. Okay. You're still eating too many carbohydrates for your personal physiology. Yeah. That's what's causing it, okay? Triglycerides are high from eating too many carbs, which break down into sugar. So as you slowly continue to lower the carbohydrates, and don't for you don't focus so much, you do need MCT oil or some kind of higher fat diet for your mental health. 100% agree with you that you're very wise. But you're going to lower the carbohydrates, and that's going to bring your triglycerides down, raise your HDL, and help your other health markers that I talked about. Thank you. Yeah? Perfect. Changed her, her mental health care provider's keto. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. You mentioned GERD a little bit ago. I just have a comment. I wanted to share an observation that I made personally. I had GERD uh, and IBS and a couple other symptoms. Uh, bad enough that it caused a Schottsky ring that I still have problems with. What caused the, um, the GERD for me was sensitivity to caffeine. This is not going to, this will only apply to a minority of the general population. Uh, I confirmed this by elimination challenge. I get symptoms at 25 milligrams a day, three days, I get symptoms really bad. Uh, less than 10 milligrams, no symptoms. So people who have GERD might want to look for completely eliminating caffeine mm -hmm. from their mm -hmm. diet. Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> Valid point. Let's talk about two other things that brings to mind. Is drinking coffee or tea, is that ancestrally appropriate? No. It keeps we, Joe alive, though. 100%. Same, same. We've only been drinking coffee, it looks like, in the archaeological record for about 5,000 years. Tea, about the same length of time. What about drinking uh, liquid dairy as adults. How long have we been doing? Is that ancestrally appropriate? How long have we been doing that? Seven, eight thousand years. Uh uh. No, no. The, you would think, but the, the anthropological research currently shows, but I kind of, I tend to think you may be right. Seems like we would have been uh, herding animals way before, but about eight thousand years ago, and, and agriculture, as far as grains and stuff, about twelve to 13,000 years. You would think it would be the other way, and it may turn out to be the other way, but it's still not more than 15,000 years. Now, we've been, we've been herding animals and, ra and husbanding animals for no, who knows how long, but drinking the milk as an adult, about, there's evidence of about 8,000 years of doing that. It's not ancestrally appropriate. I'm sorry. I love milk. I love milk. But no, it immediately causes inflammation, and I start to swell in the middle. Uh, yes. I was diagnosed with um, fatty liver disease almost 30 years ago. I was thinner than I am right now. So mm -hmm. looking at someone, you, you can't tell. The diagnosis came when uh, I was having some pregnancy issues when they were doing all the ultrasounds. Oh, you have a fatty liver. 
No one said anything about it. It wasn't then. even a big deal. It wasn't. It was it, like an, oh, by uh, the way, you, you have, have fatty liver. hypercholesterolemia. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that was what it was about. Um, I had two very high-risk pregnancies. So to Autumn's point, we need to reach out to younger women. And I know Nisha, I've been watching the cha your channel, and she's getting pushback on the proper human diet during pregnancy. If I stood up, my blood pressure would go to 220 over 120. I had to lay on my left side for six weeks. So I think that's an area I would love to see in these uh, meetings and conferences yep. to talk about a little bit more. And then 20, 20 years later, well, 15 years later, my nieces were experiencing, and we talk about PCOS. They went to a specialist, fertility specialist, about PCOS, and they like they had trouble getting pregnant. Aunt Rosie, you got to go see this guy. I'm like, I'm not going to have any more babies at 40. But I went to see him. He was the first person, uh, plus 40 person, to talk to me and tell me I had metabolic syndrome. Pulled all my my blood work from when I was pregnant. He said, look at what your insulin did from when you were 27 to where it is now. So what bothers me too still, so I'd love to see, I'd love to see your channel and Nisha's channel talk more about that because I think it's really important. My first son was in um, the NICU for six months and ended up passing away. It was 13.3 ounces at birth. And it could have been so simple, just changing what I ate back then. But the other issue I have is that the insurance companies are dictating what tests mm -hmm. your doctor is allowed to prescribe and how can we continue to fight back. I know I, we, have the, we can order our own tests now, but how about putting the power back in the physicians and yeah. not the insurance companies? No, I totally agree, yes. Totally agree. Here's the thing. Uh, you remember how back when you guys were kids, there was a pharmacist who owned his own pharmacy, and he was one of the pillars of the community, and he was highly respected. And now pharmacists are hourly employees for Walmart and Walgreens. Doctors have virtually been captured, just like the, the pharmacists have been captured. It's super rare to see a successful so, uh, sole proprietor, pharma, pharmacist now. You just can't. They're going to work for Walgreens, Walmart, whoever, and they're going to be an hourly employee, and they're going to do what they're told, or they'll get their ass fired. So they went from being that respected member of the community who was looked at basically as a doctor. Depending on who your town doctor was, they may have been better than the doctor. And now they're an hourly employee with no clout whatsoever. Doctors are quickly falling under that, and the insurance companies, they, they love administrative capture, when they can capture. Uh, back when you were a, a kid, who owned your local hospital? Who ran? Who was the administrator of your local hospital? The nuns. The nuns. nuns, right? Nuns. But the, usually the CEO was a doctor. Now that kind of makes sense, right? You know it's illegal, literally illegal for a doctor to be CEO of a hospital now. You, you, have to have a, you have to have an MBA or a PhD in business or something. You have to be a business person. And so somebody was just telling me the other day, oh, it was Kukazella. He said there's actually more administrators, like three times more administrators at his tiny hospital than there are doctors. Doctors are being captured, okay, and they're quickly losing the power. That solo lone wolf mountain lion doctor who owns his own, that's, that's going to go away unless we all just revolt against the whole system. And that, so the, owning your own labs with Dave Feldman's company or True Health Labs or one of the others online, that's one way you can take back your power. But currently doctors, it's not that the, the insurance company dictates what they order and don't order, but the doctor's going to get feedback from the insurance company. If you order too many vitamin D25s or too many C peptides or too many whatever, and they don't think that that's medically necessary, wait a minute, who's the damn doctor? Who decides what's medically necessary? I used to get calls from the case nurse telling me that what I had ordered wasn't medically necessary. And I'm, I'd be like, I'm sorry, your credentials again? And you made this decision. Well, we go by the algorithm. Well, who designed the algorithm? Mm -hmm. The MBAs, the bean counters, the attorneys, trying to save money, trying to increase their profit for the shareholders. 
It has nothing to do with your health. It's literally nothing. You are, you are persona non grata. You don't exist in their world. They're just trying to increase their profit margin. And your family doctor can't follow you in the hospital right now. It's the hospitalist. Who doesn't know you? Almost exclusively now. Almost. And that's another almost. thing it's that's It's going changed. that yeah. way. Yeah. That's yeah. Almost. And used to, if you were in the hospital, your family doctor went to the hospital and took care of you. Now most hospitals, that's not allowed. You have to see the hospitalist who doesn't know you from Adam, doesn't know your history, doesn't know your quirks and your foibles and all those other things, which sometimes are very important to your overall medical case. They can't take care of you. None of that makes sense un unless you look at it through the lens of profit for the corporation. Then, it may, then you're like, oh, yeah, I see how it makes sense now. But as far as health care, it makes no sense. Yeah, Can we do question. two more, Dr. Bear? Yeah, let's go. First of all, I want to say thank you to all the non-medical people in the room because I feel like you guys teach us something in the clinic every day. And I always encourage my patients to do their own research but tell them to have a discussion with me about it. And I feel like that's so valuable as healthcare providers. What do you do? Um, I'm a family NP. I'm primary care. Okay. When you have a patient come to you who has researched some stuff on the Internet and maybe printed something out to bring you and ask you questions, do you, do you look at them as a pain in the ass or as a highly motivated patient who's really interested in their health? I, I almost exclusively learn something from those people. So That's I'm, a good healthcare provider right there. Um, there's been many a times that I couldn't diagnose somebody and they diagnosed themselves, and 100%. I was very appreciative of that. Do you understand that. the courage and, the, and the, 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 the morality that you just heard come out of her mouth? So thank you for taking control of your own health. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you for er, being patient with my baby this weekend. Uh, yes, his first food was meat, Dr. Barry. <laughs> there you go. And he didn't die. <laughs> and he didn't die. <laughs> he didn't die. There you go. Um, so my question is um, the food sensitivity tests. They're all the rage right now. And in my point of view, I feel like there's something to do with some metabolic dysfunction and some leaky gut that leads to false positives on these food sensitivity tests because people will come back and tell me it says I'm sensitive to meat and eggs yeah and I'm like no you're not <clears throat> no uh, you're not yeah. <laughs> you're not <laughs> um so do you find that uh, how accurate do you find these things to be and are you kind of on a similar page I find the food sensitivity testing to be completely and utterly worthless 100 percent of the time so what they measure is IgG antibodies and if you've eaten meat or eggs in the, in the recent past, your levels are going to be, what, elevated? Okay, does that mean you're sensitive or does that mean you ate it recently? Literally, not joking. You think, uh, and, and uh, usually allopathically trained physicians don't put a lot of stock. It's usually the naturopaths who are doing the food sensitivity testing and they believe in it. Again, they're not, it's not a conspiracy. They believe in their heart of hearts. That's going to help you to know that you are allergic to the two foods that human beings have been eating as a species for over a million years. Do you see how immediately now knowing these principles, you're like, so I'm allergic. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a human and I'm allergic to red meat. Anybody immediately red flags like, oh, that's retarded. That's dumb. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I think they're completely useless. I, I'd never check them. I don't think they serve any useful purpose whatsoever except to make a profit for the lab company and maybe a kickback to the doctor. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I would like to ask to be locked in your barn and fed <laughs> bacon, eggs, and steak. The more I think about it, the more I think that may be a profit center for me is to just <laughs> all Amen. the ribeye and eggs you can eat. and just, Client number yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so I what happened to you, Dr. Barry's barn? <laughs> um, I don't see Dr. Harper in here, um, which I want to highlight something that he said earlier and also reinforce what Dr. Barry is saying right now. Um, the solution to all of this is not going to come through politics at all. This 100%. is community-based, 
ground up, everybody in this room that believes in some form of low-carb diet um, will change your life, your family's life, your friend's life. It is going to spread horizontally. It will not come from the top down. 100%. Dr. Harper, uh, thank you so much for highlighting that you have stopped looking for a political fix for this problem and that you are no longer pursuing policy changes. That I cannot thank you enough for saying that, and I yeah. hope... Yeah, when he said that, I got goosebumps. Yeah, I that's hope... that's exactly my philosophy as well. I hope everybody in this room understands that. I hope everybody watching understands that this is not going to come top down. No, it's going to be bottom up power than people. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's so good. We want to make sure... We got sure one more. We're, we're, while we're going over, I want to make sure, if you, Dr. Bear, if you don't mind, we're just going to finish Let's everybody go. that's still in line. Yeah. This is such a precious opportunity. I want to comment okay. on uh, Dr. Harper's work is invaluable. I love what he's doing. And just like she taught her doctor that depression gets better with a proper human diet, as more and more patients who are undergoing chemo or radiation therapy, and, and they have this crazy relative who says, you know, you really ought to eat a very low-carbohydrate diet while you're doing that. Oncologists, that's cancer specialists, if they start to see a trend, oh, if this patient eats this way, my success rate, it's all, it's, it's all selfishness, my success rate goes way up. What do you think? Do you think they're going to learn from that? When a fertility specialist, like my friend, Dr. Robert Kiltz, when he starts seeing, man, when, when women eat the, the, he calls it the, the baby diet, it's, it's basically the, the beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And he, ha he has this homemade ice cream that's basically heavy cream and stevia. He calls it get some ice cream. <laughs> when, when women eat this way, their percentage of, of pregnancy skyrockets. Do you not think the other fertility specialists in, that, in his town are going to be like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on with his success rate? How is he? I'm, I, my, my appointment book's empty. His is full. What's going on? When oncologists start to adopt this and they start telling their patients, you need to eat a proper human diet while you're undergoing this very severe and, and traumatic medical treatment to try to kill the cancer just before we kill you, because yep. that's what chemo does, right? The, 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 the competition's waiting room is going to be empty and his is going to be full. You don't think that's going to give a, an incentive? Oh, yeah, it is. That's why the power is yours. First, I want to thank you um, and everybody that's been speaking over the whole weekend. It's been amazing. But it was you that was the first person who got Brian to really looking at this path deep down, not just, oh, I just have to eat meat and eggs and that's it and I'll lose weight. You took him to a whole different level on his health. You saved his life. And I truly believe that because the way his family was going, I would have lost him in his upper 50s. He lost his parents in his 60s, grandparents in 70s, and he never knew I was scared. So anyways, thank you for that, and that in turn saved my life too. So I do have a question, obviously, since I'm up here. Okay, so I am in my upper 50s. I'm a little older than him. That's and not possible. She looks pretty good. That's not yeah. possible. Well, okay. <laughs> it is, and it's getting better on keto. Woo -woo. <laughs> so I just get basic blood work done now. And so we, we've been talking about blood panels, but I have a retired nurse friend who has kind of been balking at my keto journey, which, you know, everybody is, has that person. And so I just kind of go with the flow because I know how I'm feeling. I know I feel better. I know a lot of my pain is gone, which is why I started this journey was for the pain, not the weight loss because yep. the word diet kind of pissed me off. And so she says, well, the blood work will give you a lot of answers where you're at as far as markers, but you really need to get hair analysis done because hair analysis will give you a bigger picture 
What is your thought on hair analysis? That was a long version of my question. How many of your doctors have ordered a hair analysis? Anybody? I don't have any hair. <laughs> well, what the hell would we do with Joe? Well, let's just not go there. Shave his back. <clears throat> so, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, diagnostic testing and therapeutic modalities that this healthcare provider will recommend, and others are like, that's dumb. That, that's not going to do anything. And so in this case, hair analysis for certain conditions is invaluable, but for metabolic health, I, I, I've read no research literature. Correct me if I'm wrong, other docs in the room. I have never heard of a hair analysis as in any way useful for your metabolic health. It just that I don't even know what to say about that without being crass and crude, because you know I'm not a, I'm not like that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you use a hair analysis to find out if your kids have been smoking weed. You can just smell them. No. <laughs> or, yeah. Um, again, just thank you, Miriam, Chris, Joe, Rachel, Dr. Barry, and everyone else who's uh, spoken and contributed. And also to the community out here because you have been awesome. Talking to you, sharing stories, it's really been awesome. So thank you. Um, but to piggyback off of the GERD question, can you still, with someone who's had um, bariatric surgery, does that still apply the food it, since it's been altered? Can you still heal? In many, many cases, we've got feedback from hundreds of women and men who have had Roe and Y said that my heartburn went away. Now, <clears throat> if you've had Roe and Y, some of the other bariatric surgery, your gastrointestinal system has been permanently surgically mutilated. Right? In some cases, a big important chunk of it thrown in the garbage, right? So you're, that makes you a special case. And so if somebody who's had Rowan wire or some of the gastric banding, if you still have some reflux, despite eating a proper human diet, that wouldn't surprise me because your gastrointestinal system has been mutilated. And uh, most people, if they could go back in time, they would undo that decision. But it's too late now, so you gotta live with it and make the best of what you got. And so step one, eat a proper human diet. Step two, take the minimum amount of acid blocker that you possibly can. Um, put a couple of red bricks under the head posts of your bed. Back when Nisha and I first met, I'll tell you a good story. I, I had, remember I told you, severe heartburn. And when I raised the head of my bed, not slept on more pillows, that doesn't work. Raised the entire head of the bed about four or five inches. That helped a lot because even though you suffer during the day with symptoms, the damage is done while you're in bed asleep because you're laying flat and it, the acid just sits there, right? And so that helped a little bit, so I did that. <clears throat> and the first few nights that Nisha slept over, she's a petite little thing, right? She would wake up at the foot of the bed under the covers. <laughs> and she'd be like, I don't understand why I keep, uh, I'm, I'm at the foot of the bed. I don't understand. And it's because my bed was like this. And she would just, in the night, just she'd be under the foot of the bed. So, yeah. So, but uh, you, have to, you have to employ tricks like that to keep the acid where it belongs in your stomach. Because your esophagus is designed to withstand an occasional splash of acid, but not to just be bathed in it all day, every day, and for eight hours every night. And so you've got you've to do some special things to keep that acid down where it belongs. Right? So you might not eat for three or four hours before bed, you might elevate the entire, the frame of your bed, not just like that, the entire thing, three or four inches. And that those types of things are going to decrease it to the point where maybe you can take an occasional magnesium-based acid blocker and try your damnedest not to take a proton pump inhibitor like Nexium or Prilosec or Prevacid. Okay. Hi. They were, they were talking, so I, okay. know, but I guess I have the microphone. <laughs> so um, I have some questions. I have multiple uh, autoimmune disorders. Oh, okay. I have multiple autoimmune disorders. Um, and I have Hashimoto's, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And 
this is this is tough. <laughs> and fibromyalgia. And yeah. um, I've talked to other people with the hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, and you know they'll we'll talk about dosages of medications, and mine is like higher than I've ever heard anybody else. And I know you mentioned that your wife is in yep. remission. Yep. Which form of the diet, carnivore or keto, would be most beneficial for somebody with multiple autoimmune? Yep. So which one sounds better to you? Could you be perfectly content and happy eating meat and eggs the rest of your life and never, never look back? I could definitely give it a try. <laughs> okay. But if your answer is like, no, I kind of like broccoli and I kind of <laughs> like, you know, some blueberries, then keto. And, and so 90 days of real whole food, one ingredient, ancestrally appropriate, nutrient-dense keto, that rules out all the keto cookies, cakes, and pies, mm -hmm. right? Real food, 90 days of that, then reassess. Do you feel better? Do you look better? Do you sleep better? Is your mental health better? Because those are markers of the same exact underlying root cause that's causing your autoimmune conditions. It's all being caused by the same thing which is the chronic inappropriate inflammation and the chronic carbohydrate toxicity, right? Those two things. Yeah. And so keto is going to at least make those some degree better after that 90 days of strict keto. eating. Now, when I say strict keto, I don't mean portion control keto or calorie counting keto. I mean strict as in what you're eating, not strict as in how much you're eating. I don't give a damn how much you eat. You eat till you're comfortably stuffed. And that's hard for some people who really, one of their goals is, is to be slimmer. You're like, dude, don't tell me that. <laughs> but trust me, eat till you're comfortably stuffed of real whole keto foods. And then after that, if you're like, I don't really feel that much better, then it's time for 90 days of, of beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And then reassess after that. And then keep trying. Keep going to your doctor. Keep getting your labs checked every three months. Keep tweaking your proper human diet, whether it's keto, whether ketovore, carnivore. Keep playing until you say, ooh, I felt really good that 90 days or at the end of that 90 days. And my markers improved. That's your sweet spot. And that may change as you get older. That may change as you come off medications. You, after you start coming off some medications, you may be able to loosen up that diet a little bit and be a little less carnivore and a little more keto, right? Or you may not. So you've got to listen to your body, and that's one of the beautiful things that a proper human diet allows you to do is hear the feedback from your body. Because when you're eating shit and your body's inflamed and you're fat and you're, you're, all your markers are mucked up, you can't hear your body's feedback. You just feel like shit every day, right? But when you start to feel better and you start, then immediately when you eat something, you're like, whoa, I had, I, mm -mm, that's off the list for me. That's not part of my proper human diet. Then you eventually you'll have a list of no-nos, and it's not that you're not going to eat them because you might gain weight. You don't want to eat them because you don't want to flare up your autoimmune condition again. Right? So I would start with, with real whole food keto, unless you're like meat and eggs, booyah, what else do I need? Then carnivore for you. So think about that and be honest with yourself and pick the one that you're going to be able to stick to without cheating, because if you cheat, you ain't cheating me, babe. Right? You're cheating you and the people that love you and the people that want to keep you happy and healthy for a long time. That's who you're cheating. Yeah? Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Barry. Thank you, Dr. Barry. I want to say thank you to Dr. Barry, to all of the professionals, not, not the person that's dressed in a bunny suit, but all of these professionals and the MDs and the PhDs who are putting their careers, their licenses, their reputations on the line. Yeah. It's, this is, it is, there are a lot, as Dr. Barry has talked about, there are a lot of people who want to see him lose his license because he's bringing this information to the forefront. And we need to support them. All of these professionals, all of these people, they're out here because they care. So support them. Buy their books, join their Patreons, 
do whatever you have to do so that they can stay out here and continue to bring this information to the forefront. Because like you've heard over and over and over again, it's not going to come from Washington. It's going to come from you. You guys are going to go out, and as you see Dr. Barry's talking about, you see all these people, you're going to make an impact, and your doctor is going to go, huh, there's no medicine that fixes this. There's something going on. Thank you so much for sharing these last couple days with us. We've enjoyed getting to know you so much. Um, but I guess there's just one thing left to say if you're in a bunny suit. Don't. don't. That's all, folks. Guys, See you guys later. Be safe getting home. <laughs>